Thank you, Wafa, for starting us off on such an engaging note. Our next speaker is artist Daniel Heyman. He is a lecturer in printmaking at the Rhode Island School of Design, as well as a critic at Princeton University. The title of his talk will be The Iraqi Portraits. Without further ado, Daniel. That was an incredible and very moving talk and very hard to follow, but I hope to have something interesting to say. And I want to first start off by saying thank you, Joanne, for um, your incredibly indulgent work and Ian for putting this together and everybody else is coming to participate or to listen uh, to this uh, important talk. So um, I am going to uh, talk to you about um, some work of mine that basically started in 2000 and uh, four and lasted until about 2009 or 10, and it's, some of it's out in the lobby. Um, but uh, to kind of put other questions into your head, I just kind of like to frame the talk a little bit um, with some questions that either I think about or I think that people should think about as um, uh, just kind of generalized questions. So the, um, the talk is... Uh, Moral marks on truth or knowledge. And um, as an artist who grew up uh, and studied at a school much like this one, without any real kind of um, encouragement or even thought about working with any kind of political subject, and I kind of slowly came to the idea that art could be a very active participant in the political process and in issues of the day. Um, the, the question that constantly comes up is what is something, what is, what is it that makes something art? And um, is there a role that art has outside of the kind of art world that becomes an art artifact for something else? And is that um, a role that I wanted to gauge, engage in? And I, I love showing this the slide first. This is this uh, print. It's from, um, it was produced in Philadelphia. And it's uh, of um, an implement that was found in the mouth of a prisoner uh, who died in prison in Philadelphia in a prison in the early part of the 19th century. Um, and the prison is, is three doors or four doors down from my house. So I kind of think of it as my, my local little instrument. Um, and the question is, what is it that makes something art? Is it the image or the language? And this is a, a portrait, a watercolor and pencil portrait I did of a former Iraqi detainee from Abu Ghraib who I interviewed in Istanbul. And among his um, testimony, he said, uh, one night they brought in a detainee tied up. They called to me, do you know this man? And they pushed up his head and he was my brother. They said, if I did not cooperate, they would bring my mother. They beat my brother in front of me, my elder brother. One day I saw A, the prisoner right across from me, tied upside down, hanging by his feet. And I am writing on the bottom, refers to him being asked by some lawyers if he was ready to come to the US to testify in court. Of course, he never was given the chance. Um, or is it the context that makes something art? And this is a, um, a pretty straightforward traditional portrait of a man named Lonnie Bowen in Philadelphia. Um, and it seems to change its meaning when you find out that Lonnie Bowen uh, is a veteran, served two tours of duty in Vietnam and one in the Philippines, and was homeless for several years when I ca caught up with him in 2009. Um, other questions. Uh, the ones that kind of came up in 2004, um, uh, when Seymour Hersh published a series of photographs in the New Yorker, along with an article explaining how American soldiers in a place that I'd never heard of called Abu Ghraib had systematically um, been torturing uh, detainees and how um, the majority of the detainees uh, had never been accused of anything um, in a formal way that there wasn't any evidence against them and that the majority of the detainees had been um, 
released by the US military, which constituted for me a, a national crisis, an international crisis. And um, I kind of have to back up here just slightly. Uh, I, I, for many, many years, I've been very interested in the theme of violence and this idea that we have um, going way back in many, many cultures that violence is a great way to solve problems. And um, for many years, I've thought that that was really kind of a mis understanding and perhaps it wasn't such a, um, it shouldn't be such a central part of our policies. And the, um, the first uh, uh, war happened in the Middle East the, um, after the Iraqis uh, uh, went into Kuwait and I didn't want to deal with that in my artwork and then the second Iraqi-American war happened in 2003 and I really wanted to deal with that, but I didn't want to deal with it in a way that was political and I didn't want to get involved in the kind of political football throwing that kind of happens in a really partisan um, country. And um, actually the start of that war was pretty much a slam dunk. Everybody wanted to go into the war um, that was on record in the Senate or whatever. So then in 2004, this another issue on top of the violence of the war and on top of the idea that the war was going to solve some kind of problem that we had was this idea that in the middle of this war that was out there to liberate or democratize or free us from terrorism or whatever it was, that the centerpiece of that war and what became, the, for me, the icon of that war was that there were um, policies put in place where Americans were going to be torturing Iraqis. And that became an issue that was not about this war, that was an issue about violence everywhere, and it was a kind of pretty straightforward, for me anyway, moral issue that um, it was very hard, although in, uh, um, in polls, uh, the polls don't seem to agree with me most of the time, but the, in, polls, um, in polls, there's still a majority of Americans who think that torch is a good idea. But in my opinion, it seemed to me that that, that was a slam dunk moral question, that, that physically abusing somebody was, um, for whatever reason, uh, was not a way out of problems. So my question to myself was, does an artist have a right, maybe even an obligation, to participate in the moral, ethical, and intellectual debates of his time? Um, and how can an artist respond to a national crisis that is rarely acknowledged? And this is a separate project, whoops, that I'm not really going to talk about. Um, but I've been working with veterans, uh, veteran survivors of military sexual assault and um, it's beginning to be well known and acknowledged that there is a huge problem of rape in the military. Um, and here are two of the survivors. Um, one response is simply to bring out the truth, which is what I've been trying to do for a number of years in a number of different ways. And I'm not going to read the text from every um, image there out in the, um, in the hall, and I'm going to kind of keep it to a couple stories so that I can really concentrate on them. I'll let you read it, though. <laughs> How does an artist bear witness? Is there a role for the non-photographic image in telling the stories of war, especially when the photographers tell a one-sided story? So here are two pictures, and I'm going to show you a series of pictures, and if you want to leave the room, that's fine. Um, the left is a picture of uh, a former detainee known as the Iceman, who was killed in, um, under interrogation and packed in ice in Abu Ghraib because they didn't quite know what to do with him or how to get him out of the, um, the prison. And that's uh, an American soldier known as Sabrina Harmon giving a thumbs up. And on the right-hand side is another kind of infamous icon of the war. That's a pile of Iraqis who are naked. They have hoods over their heads. And there's a, a man behind them smiling um, by the name of Charles Grainer. Um, personally, I can't rely on photographers paying attention to something as difficult as right and wrong. And here is a very famous, uh, iconic photograph from Abu Ghraib, which is a prison just outside of Baghdad. Uh, there was a part of it, it's an enormous, enormous complex, and there was a part of it called the hard site, which is where um, the torture that we know most about happened. And um, the photograph on the left is of a man who's got a blanket, naked, except for a blanket that's been attached around his neck, and he's got a hood over his head, and he's standing on a box, and he's wearing these wires, look like they might be attached to an electrical system. And then there's a, 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 somebody fiddling with a camera, wearing army fatigues, and 
this kind of harks back to an, another picture I won't go into. Um, from, these are all pictures from, that eventually came out from this site of uh, the hard site and what to do about it. So when these came out and shocked everybody, uh, myself included, of course, I didn't, I had no idea what to do with them. I, I, it kind of was a, such a, like, you know, the war was horrible. I had spent a lot of time in the 80s talking to people about another war, one that happened in Europe, and knew that war affected people for many, many years. And, um, and I knew that there was, you know, this very, driven American propaganda trying to convince us that the bombs were going to be surgical and nobody was going to get hurt and that, you know, it was going to just take out the bad guys and then the good guys and things were going to go on and, you know, democracy was going to flourish and all that kind of crap. And um, so I wanted to somehow bring in some other idea about the war and I started making these paintings which are extremely confusing and hard to look at and have only... Um, uh, uh, it, only kind of in the background, any kind of allusion to the war. And this is, um, I think this is one of these things, right? This, uh, well, yeah, good. So this is, a, this is a painting of all sorts of different things that I love, Hokusai paintings and Indonesian puppets and architecture from France. And then in the back, there's this very unreadable image from a Japanese print that I happen to have collected, and it's of um, a soldier who's uh, holding this woman down, and there's another soldier outside the frame of the picture who's uh, raising a sword to decapitate her. And I um, started making that as this idea about the war was out there, but really we were so distracted and we were really told to go shopping and, you know, don't really pay attention and the costs were down the road. And it, there was such an amnesia, a willful, immediate amnesia about what we were doing. And I, I worked that up into a four-piece uh, four image. And I started, once the, these pictures came out, I started to kind of slip them in there so that they were there the way they were in the news. But you didn't really have to pay attention to them if you wanted to pay attention to other things. Um, and again, in the back, there's this um, decapitation going on. Uh, and that's the whole series together. This is, uh, I'm going to go through these kind of rather quickly. This is 2004, 2005, and I was working in this vein of making very large, very confusing pictures, which kind of, for me, mimicked the media, the internet, the, the political talking heads, the newspapers, everything that goes on in, in this big um, society, and then kind of would slip in these images of this war that was going on here. And um, this is a, um, a sculpture by Cellini, and it's of a hero holding up the head of, a, of, an, of an evil person. And that summer of 2004, there were a lot of decapitations in the war in the news. Um, that's kind of a close-up. There it is again. More close-ups. Um, and the last one I did on this, and I kind of then thought I would stop, was this one, which has this this um, Charles Rayner and um, Lindy England standing behind another body, a pile of Iraqi bodies are all kind of lined up and repeated over and over again, but of course you don't pay any attention to it because you can't see it unless you want to. Um, and I felt at that point that the, those pictures, that very limited amount of visual information that I had that came from the 23 or five pictures that were released to the internet, through the internet, um, they did exactly the thing I didn't want to do in my work, which was they continued to dehumanize and victimize the people that were in them. The people that were in those pictures were always in the pictures naked and hooded and nameless and homeless and uh, without a background. And they seemed to be the only thing I could grab onto as an artist, the only visual image, but they were not... Um, they were not useful because my idea was to humanize the victims of a war and to understand that the war is not about a political, the wars happen to people but not to um, political philosophies. And so um, I was kind of giving up the idea. And then I met this incredible 
human rights lawyer who lived in Philadelphia named Susan Burke. And Susan Burke was, I think, an exceptional person, is an exceptional person. She's a, a, a lawyer who was working on some big pharmaceutical cases and kind of listening to what was out there and thought to herself that there was um, uh, torture going on and started to investigate torture even before the, the news came out about torture. Anyway, Susan eventually did a lot of research, hooked up with a guy named Sharif Akil in, in, in um, Detroit. And I can t it's a much longer story, I can tell you that uh, later. But, um, and got involved with suing f on behalf of the Iraqi torture victims. And her idea was that the I was talking about this this morning at breakfast, that lawyers are incredibly good and trained at talking to other lawyers. They have this language all by themselves, and if you ever listen to them, you can't understand a word unless you're trained in that language. And that language is incredibly important for bringing a certain kind of justice to light. But that they were very bad at getting the information that they collect out to the general public. That's not their job. Their job is to get the information that they collect either across to a jury or across to a judge, but not out to the general public. So Susan Burke had this idea, and knowing the history of uh, cases in the Vietnam War that took 10 and 20 years to come to an end, that the only way to really get um, some kind of public justice for the people that she was uh, uh, pro uh, prosecuting on behalf of was to engage writers and artists and poets and photographers and playwrights and people whose job was to communicate ideas to the public. And we met and she said, why don't you come over to Jordan? I'm going over in a couple of weeks and we're gonna go interview some former detainees from Abu Ghraib and you can come over and make some art. And I thought, sounds like she knows what art is. So, um, so I decided to go and I took over a bunch of copper plates because I'm a printmaker and I teach up here at RISD printmaking and I thought I should make some after a while. And um, the copper plate, the kind of printmaking I was doing was called dry point, which is, uh, I kind of chose it because I was a little scared if I did any other kind of um, printmaking, either I would lose the information because it can chip off in different methods of the place before you get it into acid when you get back home, or if I was going to do drawings and things, I was very worried that things were going to get confiscated, that I wasn't going to be able to bring it home if it was really visible. And at dry point, you scratch into a copper plate and you really can't see it. So I'm um, sitting down and I decide I'm going to do eight portraits of eight former detainees, and if I bring the portraits home, that that's really going to be able to somehow address the story of um, this kind of moral crisis. And I'm doing this portrait of this young man who's um, telling me this horrendous story about being um, arrested in the middle of the night and brought to an airport uh, detention center and interrogated and stripped and handcuffed and put face down on the ground and put in the back of a truck and driven around. And, all these terrible things, and I thought to myself, God, I got his nose wrong. I mean, it looks like, here it is. See, this is really wrong here, and this is too small, and I wish I'd gone to art school. And, um, and I thought, uh, at the time, I thought, it's so, like, it just clicked, it's so irrelevant. The thing that's relevant is the testimony that this man is giving to me, and I have to bring it back in the artwork. That's the only thing that I really can do, other than bring back his face, which has been hidden and blocked and um, negated. I can bring his face back in his words, and so I started to copy the words of his testimony into the artwork. And I did that for the next five years in various media, and I'm gonna show you some of them. Um, but I'm going to tell you this story first because this one's really moving. Are we up to the, yeah. Um, that's the first one, right? Okay, great. So this, uh, I, I listened to testimony of over 50 people um, that were detained at Abu Ghraib and other prisons in Iraq. And um, all of whom, in order to participate in these cases, and there were about 200 plus or minus, um, Iraqis that participated in the cases that were, cases that were run by Susan Burke and Sharif Akil. And in order to participate, the plaintiffs had to have documentation from the US military stating that they had been arrested uh, by mistake, that there was never any evidence against them, that they'd never been accused of anything, and that they were released free of any charges. So as far as I was concerned, I didn't need to do any background on these people. Background checks. No, I'm not a journalist anyway, so. Um, 
Anyway, this guy comes in, this is the first session of interviews, the first week of interviews, and he, we've already heard from his nephew who was arrested when he was 16 and kept in, in Abu Ghraib until he was 17 and a half or so, for about a year and a half. And, um, and then the uncle comes in and he tells us this incredible story about he and his wife and his five children and his brother and his wife and their two children and the parents lived together in a house that had been in the family for 10 or 11 generations. They weren't really sure, it was outside of Baghdad. And the house was on a kind of dirt road and across the road there were these two little shacks and one of them had um, sweets and the other one had sodas and they kept them locked and it was Ramadan and the family was gathered for the holiday meal eating inside and the kids wanted to go across the street to get sweets. So they gave the kids the keys and the kids went across the streets, across the street and when they got across, when they left the house, the uncle, the man, told me, we heard an explosion go off. So I went outside and I saw that two of my sons, a nine-year-old and 11-year-old, had been killed in an explosion of a bomb. And I didn't know what to do, and I picked up my son. And he said, and this happened many, many times. A bomb would go off if there were American soldiers in the area. They would kind of round up all the men in the area and take them in for questioning, figuring somebody knew something about the bomb going off. So here's this guy whose two kids have just died. And he picks up his son and a soldier comes at him and there's a helicopter that's kind of hovering over him. And he says he's held up his son to the helicopter and he said, this is my son, this is my son. And he said he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to put the son down. He just kept saying, this is my son. And then the soldier came over and made him put his son down and made, uh, handcuffed him and put him face down on the ground next to the body of his dead son and then was communicating with the helicopter and saw that his other son had been decapitated and he brought his head, the head of the other son over and put it next to this guy. And this was the first 30 minutes of a six hour or so interview. And I'll tell you that um, nobody listened to the rest of the interview. I mean, we all took notes and we made pictures and everything, but the idea that this guy, this really human story of this guy's loss, um, was kind of followed by this incredibly inhuman story, I mean, they're both inhuman, of, of him being uh, kept in Abu Ghraib's heart site for 135 days and tortured. It just didn't, didn't make any sense, and it, it um, yeah, it didn't make any sense. Still doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna kind of skip over this. This is, uh, um, I believe, the, the title of this show out, out there comes from this, um, this portrait here. I'm sorry, it's difficult to start. Um, this guy was incredible. This was the second trip I went on to Istanbul, um, and I'm going to skip it. This is uh, d after night, dinner, we would go out. And, and then we come to, there's a large book out in the, in the hallway, and I kind of want to tell you about that. So um, this is a very infamous picture, and it shows an American service person on the left in Lindy, England, and a faceless guy um, down here naked, doesn't look like he's doing too well. And um, after the interviews with the lawyers, then we had this large binder, two binders of, of photographs, and the lawyers were trying to build a case, and they would go through every single photograph, and they would ask do you, if, if the um, testifier wanted to, or felt they could, do you remember this? Did you see anything like this? Do you know who this is? Do you know where this is? Building a case. And um, so we get to that photograph and ask this guy if he knows it, and he says, oh yeah, I know that, that's me. And of course, there's no corroborating evidence, so the lawyers have told me I'm not allowed to tell you that he said, that's me, but um, this was his, uh, his testimony about that picture. And I'm gonna read you something from a guy named Nick Flynn, who's a poet that came over with us and was in the interviews for this man. And um, I think it kind of gives you an idea of um, what it was like to listen to these testi testimonies. The room turns out to be utterly mundane, well lit, carpeted, a hotel room that one could find in any major city. The bed has been removed and in its place is a table. The lawyer sits at the table across from the ex-detainee. Another lawyer sits next to her, try typing out the transcript of the conversation on a laptop. The translator sits at the head of the table between the lawyer asking the questions of the ex-detainee. There is also an artist present, seated away from the table near the window, painting a watercolor portrait in a large book, his pages folded like an accordion. When he isn't painting the portrait, he fills the white space around the painted head with bits of what is being said. The seat next to the ex is empty, and that is where I sit, my notebook open. 
It is likely that you have seen the photograph of the naked man being dragged by a leash out of a cell by a girl named England. Let's call him Amir. This is the third time the lawyers have met with Amir. The first time was in Amman, Jordan, where he told about his years in Abu Ghraib. The second time was six months ago in Istanbul when a team of doctors examined him to corroborate his scars. This time is for him to look through the binders of the now infamous photographs to identify who and what he can. A painting on the wall behind his head depicts the scene from Turkey's past, peacocks and lions mingling together. It is only a year since Samir was released from prison. The soldiers called the day of his release the happy bus. Tomorrow you go and ride on the happy bus, they told him. Today, a year later, Amir shakes his head as he looks at the photographs of himself from that time. I cannot rec my, recognize myself as that man, he says. Can you? There's a moment in... Oh, hold on, I'm going to skip around here a little bit. In Istanbul, while collecting testimonies, we each, each ex-detainee to describe the room where his torture took place. Each man looked around him. It looked like this room, each responded. There was a table, there was a computer, someone was always behind me. What did the person who tortured you look like, was the next question. And the de detainee would look at me, and then he would look at the artist, the only two white men in the room, and either point to him or point to me. He looked like him, was the answer. There is a moment in Amir's story, as there will be in every story, when words are not enough, a moment when the only way to tell us what happened is to show us what they did to his body. At this moment, he pushes back from the table and stands. They hang me this way, he says, his arms raised out to his side as if crucified in the air. Something about him standing, something about his body suddenly rising up completely unhinges me. Something about it makes his words real in a way they hadn't been before. At this moment, I get it. These words are about his body. It was his body this story happened to, the body that is right here beside me in this room. I could barely even imagine just yesterday his body that is now filling the air above our heads, our eyes upturned to see him. Amir stands there like that, arms outstretched. The scribe has nothing to write. The painter has nothing to paint. The interpreter has nothing to interpret. The lawyer's eyes are fixed on his eyes. All his words have led to this one moment when his body is finally allowed to speak. The lawyer shakes his head slightly. And what happened next, she says slowly, and he lowers his arms and sits. Which I think kind of connects a lot to, um, to your work, in a way. Um, these are some other, um, I don't know what color I'm up to. I'm okay. So these are some other pages from that book, and I just thought I would, um, you know, give you a, like the crib notes. This was, a, um, this was a guy who was kept in, um, we had these really weird discussions after these interviews because people would say, well, that was really bad. And somebody would say, well, no, but the other guys was worse, which is horrible. So this, this guy, at one point in his, um, uh, at one point in his detention in Abu Ghraib, um, he was put in a box, two feet by two feet by six feet, a big black box, and he was, he was handcuffed with his hands behind his back, and he was kept in that box for 16 days. And every three days, he was taken out and given an IV drip. And um, once a day, he was taken out and allowed to go to the bathroom. On the way to the bathroom, they would put his head under a big bell, and they would ring it so that he said, he, at that point, he couldn't walk. They would drag him to the bathroom. That was pretty horrible. And it kind of reminded me of some studies I did when I was in college and after college when I was in Europe listening to stories about, about World War II and the Holocaust. These things didn't happen because of one or two people. Somebody, some back office person ordered those boxes and had them shipped and somebody else signed in for them and had them brought in and another team of somebody got an IV set up and somebody came out and did the IV and it, it um, it, uh, it wasn't just a few bad apples. This is a guy that's on the um, poster, and I think this is the last one I'll talk about. Oh, no, one more. Um, this, guy, this guy was a really depressed um, person and a really sweet man, and we talked to him for about six or seven hours, all told, in Est Istanbul in 2000 and something. And 
Um, I was told in the morning of his, um, oh, that's funny. There's another slide underneath there. Oh, up here, you can't see it. But anyway, I was told in the morning of his um, uh, interview that he had a lot of things to tell us, that he was going to really, um, you know, his, he was detained for a very long time and he had many, many incidents of torture and that he was really central to the case. And, and I, you know, I was never really told by the lawyers much of anything. I was never allowed to read files or anything. So I opened up my, my accordion book instead of, to about this size, which is what I usually did, I opened it up much larger because I thought, okay, there's going to be a lot of writing today, so I'm going to open up this big book. And I start to do here, and I'm, I apologize, I don't know what happened to the slide, but um, this under uh, painting, and then um, as I'm working on the under painting, I start writing the testimony as the lawyers start asking questions. And then I would go back usually, you know, when the uh, lawyers asked the same question incessantly. So there was always time to go back and finish the painting. Anyway, I'm working on this painting and he starts to tell us about being, um, being interrogated at the, um, uh, being interrogated at Abu Ghraib. And he said that he was, um, they would come to his cell where he was kept and he was uh, basically beaten up until he um, passed out and then he would come to in the interrogation room where he was again beaten up until he passed out and then he would come back, come to again in his cell and this went on for um, many days. And then at that point he was t starting to tell that story and he broke down and he left and we didn't know, nobody knew where he was, nobody had a way of contacting him, he left the hotel, he ran out into his cell and we had no idea if he would ever come back and I kind of thought, I'm going to, if he ever comes back, I'm going to leave this space in the book because he needs that space to kind of collect himself and we need that space to take it in. And then he came back and I did another portrait of him. And I think this is the page that's open out there. But, um, and he never really lifted his eyes up at that point and he was um, obviously had been extremely upset and told us that not only was he interrogated that way, but when the interrogation was over, it was winter and for four or five months he was chained naked to his cell like this every day and they would bring every half hour or so dogs to bark at him and throw cold water on him. And, um, and I think I'm gonna leave it there. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. And I ask for questions. Yeah. How did, how did the prisoner get out of Turkey from Iraq? Who got them out? The, the lawyers, um, when they started working with these cases, uh, one of the lawyers is an Egyptian American. And so initially he went over to Baghdad and hired two local Iraqis. One was a, veter a veterinarian who had no employment because um, the veterinary clinics closed down at the war. And the other one was just a kid in, in college. And those two were living in Baghdad, and so they would vet the, they kind of set up a website and set up a kind of, um, you know, a community of links between people. And they would, um, when they had gathered enough people and vetted them to make sure they had all the paperwork necessary for the trial, they would then drive them to, it started out in Jordan, and then in 2005 the Jordanese closed the border to Iraqis and made it much more difficult. So then they would fly with them to um, Istanbul, and then they would go back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for your talk and for the work that you do. Um, I was wondering if you can talk about the process and the approach of these works, um, um, and about some of the choices you have to make, the artistic choices you have to make as the person making, creating this work, and also as a witness hearing the story. So I noticed that some of them had a lot of text, some of them have a very little text. Um, and I guess I would just love to hear you talk a little about how you approach yeah. this. Well, um, I never know the story prior to the start of the interview. And um, the lawyers were not going to, they never, never sh they allowed me to come and they were really nice, but they didn't let me see any of their paperwork. So, um, uh, so I didn't have a plan. I just um, uh, kind of knew that there was going to be, you know, something. And, and so the first, the first trip I went over, I kind of, I didn't have a lot of material. I didn't have a lot of experience. And I kind of listened to when I thought the story coming up was really going to encapsulate enough 
to capture this person's testimony. So it was a bit of a um, shot in the dark and sometimes it seemed like something coming up was going to be really important but it was more mundane and I would write it anyway or I would stop and wait for another moment. The second trip I decided a completely other tactic and there are three of those out there. I decided I was going to capture every single word that was translated in the room when I was in the room. So those are really covered with, with words and very repetitive. And then um, on some of the other ones like this one, this was, I didn't know anything about this guy. And he never went to Abu Ghraib, which is a kind of a great thing because everybody thinks all this happened at Abu Ghraib. A lot of people can confuse Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, but he was in another prison and he started telling this unbelievably horrendous story about having his penis tied with a string and being forced to drink eight liters of water one after the other. And um, I've talked to some doctors afterwards, like they think it could have killed him. And that story was so crazy. I wanted to make the words difficult for you because that's difficult. We asked him to be our torture victim in a way, right? And then we, the lawyers, asked him to repeat this horrendously difficult story to us and hear it. And I kind of feel like it should, you shouldn't have free and easy access. It shouldn't be written out in a nice and easy way for you. So as that story started to get really crazy, I kind of started to write it all over the page. And um, also, I ended up doing three of his portraits. By the last one, I wasn't really that interested in, in finishing a portrait because the story was so uh, overpowering. But so that's kind of how I thought of it. It kind of like, you know, was organic. And Thanks for the question. None of them were allowed to pray. That was, a, that, was a, that was one of the easiest way to torture them. How many of them maintain their faith after they left prison? I have no way of knowing that. But they seemed to me to be um, a great variety. There were some people who were not religious and some people who were extremely religious. In general, I would say they were, Iraq is a more religious society than ours is, so they seemed to be you know, predominantly um, uh, practicing Muslims. I never touched the work after the interviews. Everything that was written was during the interviews, primarily because by the time I got to this project and I had been working with those other uh, images, I, I really had this like visceral dislike of, of editing these people. I mean, we talked about these people for years without ever asking them to tell us their own story. So I made it a point to only write what I heard translated. And I don't speak Iraq, uh, Arabic, so I can't really write um, first-hand testimony. But I could get as close as I could. And that was to write only the testimony I heard being translated and only at the time I heard it being translated. I didn't come home, take notes, clean it up, think about how I was going to write it onto the work. So you had, it was a personal, <laughs> intimate, immediate transference of their experience. Yeah. That wasn't, yeah, you know, the lawyers are pretty um, mindful of the clock. They would not have let any kind of side discussions go on in a way. You know, afterwards, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of them were really thrilled to be in Istanbul because there were some really great um, pilgrimage sites and they all went to the, the Blue Mosque and other places. Um, there was an imam that we uh, interviewed. Thank you very much. I wondered if any of the subjects um, of these portraits had a chance to look at your work and if they didn't look at your reaction. This guy wanted to take a picture home. So the next day, I sat down with him for you know two hours in the cafeteria and, and did his picture. They all looked at the work right as it was being made. And um, some of them I became Facebook friends with. And um, in the first couple of years, 2006, 2000, and 2007, there was a really violent civil war going on 
underneath or above the American war that was going on. And these people that were talking to us were extremely scared. And they didn't want to have any evidence of talking to Americans. So they didn't want copies of the work. They didn't want anything like that. This was in 2008. Things had changed, and there was a different attitude. And I actually made pictures for two people that wanted to take them home. But then there was a, you know, I was a, I was, they didn't care about me. I was a, like a, an art, you know, some artist. Like they cared about the lawyers. That's who they cared about. And sometimes we had Doctors Without Borders with us or something like that, or somebody that was from National, you know, National Public Radio came once. But the, I was so completely out of their consciousness that they would, um, you know, I was kind of more fun. So it was kind of a humorous moment. They'd come over and say that, you know, why did you paint my shirt yellow? It wasn't yellow. Or, you know, why does my nose look like that? Uh, hi, Ben. Hi. <laughs> That's a complicated question. I don't know if I really have an answer for you, but um, uh, I think that three years ago in this country is a different time and place than, th than today. And I think that there's more distance, and I think that there's, um, you know, there's a little bit more of a, I mean, the political class has closed the book on this war and there is no discussion whatsoever about torture in Iraq. But the rest of the country, I think, is a little bit more able to look at that war as, you know, as a, a, a foreign policy failure that is as big as Vietnam. And, um, and there's more willingness to look at that face to face. I don't know if that pertains particularly to veterans, but um, I've done a lot of work with veterans since then because I started working with these MSA um, uh, survivors. And um, the veterans, well, veterans that went to, to Iraq I, I don't know how to answer the question. <laughs> I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to speak for anybody. I've had, there have been times when I've had hostile audiences. I don't expect one at Brown. Well, I think the, the point is that you, get, you present a personal experience, and at that time there was already um, papers of record, like the New York Times had already documented so much of this, and it was interesting to see young people, students, and adults who were veterans who really just, they could not see it. Well, in 2004, Seymour Hersh publishes an article, there's nothing new, really, that's come since then. I mean, it was all there in front of our eyes the whole time. And still, we re-elected the government that brought us there and, and supported the war and, you know, yeah. Hi, Daniel. Uh, we have a question from one of our remote viewers in Tehran who would like to ask you whether you think that art can have a tangible role in exposing the truth in the way you've tried to do here. And so I have a question is coming from Halal. 
Oh, great. Well, thank you for the question. That's great. Um, uh, yes, I, I think I, th I like the question a lot because um, I do think that art has a very tangible role in exposing truth. I don't think, personally, that art has much of a role in changing political policy. Um, but yes, I think art is a great place to witness and to, to witness, art, you know, artists are the unpaid outsiders. They are not part of any establishment, um, the good ones anyway. And their, their, um, their, their, their job is to look at their time and some way make sense of it. You know, the world is basically chaos and an artist is basically trying to understand the chaos. So I think that, you know, art is a great, great kind of place to think about and witness truths. Okay, good, thank you.